evening. Good evening. Welcome to Bunker Hill Baptist Church. All of you who have come, you especially faithful and true Christians that have come tonight, despite whatever's going on in the world. I don't know what else could be going on tonight. But thank you for each and every one that's come tonight because you have come to worship. You've come to God's house, to God's sanctuary. So thank you for being faithful tonight, all of you that have come and joined us tonight. I'm not going to go over all the announcements, but I do want to announce that uh, in February we are just doing the evening worships, I mean the morning and evening worships on Sunday. Uh, there will be no Wednesday night activities, no Sunday school or discipleship training. The church council will meet again at the end of the month on the 28th and make a decision for March. We hope to be opening up pretty soon by then, but we will see. But uh, keep in prayer for the church council and the decisions that need to be made as well. Tonight in our prayer request, uh, a couple more names have been added and, and one update if you did not hear. This morning we prayed for Greg Cooper. He, uh, he was having COVID. They were trying to get him stable uh, last time we had heard. Uh, Mr. Greg had passed away this morning. Uh, he had, he had uh, passed away at about 10.30 a.m. this morning. So that is uh, Mr. Greg Cooper. Uh, he passed away at uh, Marion General. There's no announcements yet about funeral arrangements. Um, I talked to Miss Carolyn, uh, his sister, Miss Carolyn Polt, this afternoon. But um, as soon as I know, we will put it out there for all the church. Uh, also, Miss Naomi Whitehead, uh, she's had a really bad stroke. A Naomi Whitehead, uh, she was one not mentioned this morning, and she is not doing well. So we want to be praying for her. Others that were mentioned this morning, uh, Mr. Ernie Buckley has had some heart blockage. I'll uh, be praying for him. The family of Jay Martin and Ellen Bedwell. That is Veronica Shivers' aunt, Ellen Bedwell. She passed away. And also keep Tom and Suzanne in your prayers as they are dealing with uh, the passage of their grandson, Bradley Knoll, who passed away last week. Also keep Brother James Robbins in your prayers. He's still got a lot to go. Uh, he does sound a little bit better every day and a little more hopeful, but he has a long way to go in his recovery. Are there any other names that need to be added to the prayer list tonight? Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come into your house, we can come into your sanctuary. And I pray for all those that have come in tonight, Lord God, that we would put down our walls, Lord God, and simply uplift your name, a name that is meant to be above all other names, Lord God. Whatever it is that's on our minds, on our heart, worrying us, weighing us down, whatever is that on earth, Lord God, we submit that to you. We put that at your throne. And tonight we simply come to worship you. For a God that created us, a God that loves us, a God that died for us and rose again so that we can have eternal life. And so let us praise you for that hope, for that promise, amongst all the other things that we see in the news today, things that burden us down, things that worry us, what's going to happen to our country, what's going to happen to this world. We know what's going to happen to us eternally because of the promises in your word. So thank you for that, Lord God. I just pray for Brother Melvin tonight as he leads us to the throne so that we can worship tonight. And pray for the instrumentalists and all those involved tonight, Lord God. May you just bless them and all those that have come in attendance tonight. God, we lift up those names that were mentioned. Let them know that there is a God that loves them and a church praying for them. That even through this valley, Lord God, you never depart from their side, that you love us. Let us all be reminded tonight that you love us, and whether we are, on the, we are in the valley or we are on the mountaintop, you never depart from us, Lord God, and you always walk beside us so that we need to keep going. Tonight, let us keep going with our praise, Lord God, let us praise, praise you with our worship and all that we have tonight because you deserve all that we, all that we are. In your name we pray, amen. <clears throat> wow, Super Bowl Sunday. I think the first Sunday that Kathy and I was here at Bunker Hill happened to be Super Bowl Sunday, and uh, that was in the other uh, sanctuary, and they had the chairs up front where a deacon sat, and over on the left side over there, left side as y'all see it, and look, uh, Preston Selman was sitting, and he stood up and said, I think I make a motion that we call off church tonight because of Super Bowl Sunday. 
And I thought, my word, I never seen a church like that before. But you know, that of course they didn't do it that Sunday, but it just got everybody's good attention that morning. All right, the, tonight we're going to be singing the first song if I can get them right in order. <laughs> The Lily of the Valley, 153. Please stand, please, as we sing. I have found a friend in Jesus, everything to me. He's a fairish of 10,000 to my soul. Footsteps of Jesus, 550.
right? The Bond of Love, 387. Instrumentalist, if you have your copy of God's Word, if you would turn to 1 Timothy, we're going to continue our walk through Timothy. One thing as we're going through Timothy to keep in mind, especially this first chapter, this is Paul writing to Timothy. And If you remember from the first week when we talked about this, Paul has two letters to two pastors, Timothy, 1 and 2 Timothy, and Titus. So this is, when you read this, this is one minister to the other. This is, especially this first chapter, this is the charge that he writes to Timothy. This first chapter is the charge of what's most important. And a mentor relationship has its own set of challenges. What is important that you teach someone? What is important that you learn? And everyone should have a mentor that they look up to to teach you lessons in life that you may not necessarily can learn on your own. There was a young doctor who was starting his rounds at a rather large hospital. And this older doctor was his mentor. And so there was one patient he had on the floor, and he said, doctor, uh, just to this older doctor, he said, I I don't know that I can break the news to him, but we've got to amputate his leg. I I don't know what to say. I don't know how to say it, and I don't know what to do. So the older doctor looks and says, look, I guarantee you I can not only make this man sign away his right to amputate the leg, but he'll be happy to do so. So they walk in to the room, and the older doctor sits down. He says, I have some bad news to tell you. It appears that we have found a spot of cancer on your lungs, and it appears you only have a short time to live. What do we need to do to make the will out to those families, relatives around? And the young man looked, he said, are you serious, doctor? I'm just a young man, I'm in my 20s, I can't believe the news that you gave me, and the doctor looked down at his prescription, he looked up, he said, well, aren't you James Michael Watson? He says, no, I'm I'm Donald Watson. He says, oh, well, we just need to take your leg off, because if you don't, gag ring could set in, bad things could happen. And he said, oh, doctor, please take my leg off. I'm just so glad to hear the news of that. A lesson was taught that day, but mentors have an interesting way of teaching lessons to the ones that they have. One goal as Christians is we should all be mentoring others uh, in this church and others in our lives. We're going to be challenged with, as we come back, a lot of good ideas are going to happen as we kind of come out of COVID. What can we be doing as a church? What are the projects? What are the missions? What do we need to be doing? What do we need to start? A lot of people are going to have ideas that are going to start. But what's going to grow our church and every church is people mentoring to the individuals, not just the programs. Why are you here tonight? Why did you come to church tonight? Why are you involved in church at all? Was it the programs that you had growing up? Or was it the people that poured into you? It's going to be important that we realize that we have a job to pour into others and teach them what ministry really is. 
I had a youth minister growing up. When I was about 15 or 16, I wanted to, to go into youth ministry. I thought it was a cool thing. And I, and I always wanted to do that. And in our youth ministry, we had outgrown the rooms that we were meeting in, and so we met in the gym part. We had a stage and we had to set up chairs. But because it was the gym fellowship hall part of our church, we had to set up every Wednesday. And so that requires you to come in early, set the chairs up, and then after everyone was over, you take everything down. So he, some of us that were interested or he wanted to mentor, that was our job. We had to go in. Some weeks it was just me going in, setting up chairs, and then staying after, afterwards and taking it all down again. And after a couple of months, I can remember getting frustrated because you would start seeing just trash left behind, you know, things thrown about, whatever, or stains on the floor, you know, whatever. And I said, I can't believe that they would do this. I can't believe, and I can't believe that, you know, no one would at least, like, thank me for doing this. And I just remember telling my youth pastor, I, I can't believe people are just doing this and they don't realize it. I can't even get a thank you for what I do. And he looked at me then and said, welcome to ministry. Because that's what it's really all about. Tonight, after everyone leaves, I'm gonna go check the pews for some trash and then I'm gonna go and get the CDs and or the DVD that was made tonight and help it to, to transfer, stay here an hour, hour and a half after everyone's gone and make sure it can edit for tomorrow so we can post it. But I'm gonna do the things that need to be done because they need to be done. I'm not telling you this for any applause by any reason. It just needs to get done. But there are times in ministry where you stand in front of hundreds, even thousands preaching the gospel and have the crowd into you and then immediately you're breaking down the chairs and you're cleaning up the floor as soon as it's, as it's over. There's a humility side that we have to get through to realize this is what it's all about. And I'm saying this to everyone here tonight because you have come, despite what else is going on in the world, Super Bowl Sunday is always the worst attended Sunday in our church's history and for a lot of churches as well. But oftentimes we can make it just coming to church is our reward. That's, that's all our goal is. But everyone here has a ministry that we need to be involved in, that you should be involved in. Everyone here, God has worked on a calling, whatever it is, even if it's to visit, to write letters, whatever it is, coming to church is to be around other Christians, to be inspired so that we can all go and share the gospel. But we need to realize, and I need to tell you, that people are gonna take your ministry for granted. People are gonna take what you do for granted. People often come up to this church and they throw, and we'll find trash uh, in the pews or they'll throw cigarette butts down or whatever it is around. They will discard and think nothing of it. They'll take for granted what others do but for us that do, it's not about the applause or the recognition. It's just because this is God's house and it's what we need to do. But when we take on and say, I should be rewarded, I should have more power, control, whatever, or I'm not getting enough praise, so I'm gonna give it up. And again, a lot of ideas are gonna come out of what do we need to do getting out of COVID? What do we need to do to get all these people back? But it's not that one big program that's gonna save us all. It's that one big God serving him and pouring into individual lives and then bringing them back. Paul was charging Timothy with a very important job of watching the church he was pastoring, watching those teachers and making sure they were teaching what they were supposed to. Letting him understand that people are going to be mad when you speak the truth. This isn't just you stand in the spotlight and get all the glory. You stand to speak the truth and sometimes that can rob you. Sometimes we can get up here, I can get up here, pastors can get up here and preach or at any pulpit on a Sunday and get caught up in, well, they didn't respond well enough. Let me go back and let me add some more puppy stories, crying stories. Let me add some things to get some reactions out of people. 
But going back to verse 5, what he charges Timothy with is he says, the aim of our charge is love, not the crowd, not the responses, not anything of what they're going to say. It is love that is issued from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. It is our responsibility as ministers of the gospel to make sure when we come into God's house and deal with God's people and teach from God's word that it comes out of a sincere place, out of a pure heart. Because bad theology comes out of bad motives. When somebody's heart gets twisted, when they feel that they're not recognized or they're not getting their way, or something happens and they can begin to twist God's word. You look at Satan when he tempted Jesus, he twisted God's words to tempt Jesus for being mortal, for tempting him with his hunger, for tempting him wanting to be praised, for throwing down temptations. Satan tempts us today in that same way that we have to check ourselves. We were talking earlier about, you know, Sunday nights, about how the good TV programs have always been on Sunday nights. For many of you growing up, you remember that wild world of Disney and Bonanza and all that, and nothing changes. You still have good programs tonight. It's not that Satan gives you this, here's the enemy, and he shows up with big red horns. Satan shows up with everything that you want. It's good enough and takes away from you. He goes into your pride and tries to steal away what God is doing. His job is to make us powerless. His job is to make our church divided and powerless. And so if we don't watch what others are doing, we don't watch what's coming out, if we don't know God's word, then things can become twisted around. So starting, we're going to finish the first chapter tonight. So starting there in verse 12, Paul says, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Now, if you were to read through Timothy, you would see this section and you would just say, well, Paul's got a very thankful heart. Isn't that wonderful? But I want to show you tonight, there is, in Jewish thought, growing up, as Paul would have been a Jewish boy, there is a theme, there is a practice that Jews have called Hakarat Hatav. And I apologize for my southern drawl butchering it, two Hebrew words. But Hakarat Hatav. That is the practice of finding good in all circumstances. It is always looking on the bright side of things, always with gratitude, always with thanks. And you will see in many of Paul's letters, he always has something about, I thank God for, thanks be to God. There's something about a thankful heart that comes out of gratitude. But that is taught in Jewish, in the, in the Old Testament ways, when Jewish boys and girls would go to school, they would learn about this hakarat hatav. And so you find this mentioned in the Deuteronomy. Well, we were slaves in Egypt, but we were treated with hosp hospitality. Or my kids keep me up late at night, but at least I have kids, you know. Uh, it's very hot outside, but at least I'm still alive. Something, something you're always trying to find and be thankful for, because it's very easy to get down on ourselves, down in situations, and not find the good in anything. And so Paul, having been taught this growing up Jewish, he was taught this practice, so he was always looking on the bright side for something. So what did Paul say? What was the good side of Paul? Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, keep in mind, when Paul starts out this letter, it's a lot about Paul. It's a lot about who he is and what he's done, but Paul always kind of gives it to, points it toward Christ Jesus. Some of you read the book a long time ago, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. 
if you remember that book, when you're writing a letter, you're supposed to always start out never about yourself. You're always supposed to point it to the other person. But Paul was always saying, look at my example, because my example points to Christ. We always point others to Christ no matter what we do. It may sound like Paul is, is trying to look at me, look at me, but he's saying really look at Christ. Now I'm thankful for what Christ has done because that's the only good. So verses 12 and 14 again, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted in ignorance and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed with me, and the faith and love that is in Christ Jesus. So what is Paul then saying about why he received in Christ Jesus? He judged me what? Faithful. Remember, he's talking to Timothy who is about to pastor this church, been pastoring this church, about to be there for a while. So what is most important? What did Christ judge Paul to be? Faithful. So Timothy, what's most important in your ministry? Being faithful. God is always looking for the faithful, not the ones that always act perfectly, not the ones that have the best resume. When you go back and look at Abraham, Abraham, tried to tell the Pharaoh in Egypt that his wife was his sister because he was afraid. You go back and look at Noah and Moses and David and the mistakes that they made, but yet they were still faithful. People are going to make mistakes, but how faithful can we continue to be? And Paul lists all the problems that he had, but he said the only good is what Christ has done to me. And we need to realize Christ is calling each and every one to their ministry here at this church. And they're not going to be as always perfect people, though we should strive to be. But we can't hold their past. We can't hold what they've done. We need to realize that if God has called someone to ministry, we need to empower them to minister and not hold them back in their ministries as well. Maybe they're going to let God down. That's between them and God. Our job is to look and say they want to be faithful. They want to do. We need to empower. He is saying, look at the people of this church in Ephesus. Look at me. I was not perfect. I was a blasphemer. I persecuted. I did a lot. And if it were up to me, I would never be selected as a missionary. I would never be selected as a pastor. But yet God used me. God's going to do great and awesome things with people you never expected. Simply because they want to be faithful. And God can do great and awesome things with you. But not if you're looking for the applause of men. Or for the spotlight to be on you. But as long as you're concerned of giving it all to God, great things are going to happen. But it's how faithful you can be. In that. All right, going to verse 15. This saying is trustworthy, deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners of whom I am foremost. What a great life verse to cling to. What a great verse to look at for all believers. Look at that again in verse 15. The saying, this saying is trustworthy and deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners of whom I am for most. This is immediately saying, what, following up what Paul is just talking about, that even though I was this person, this statement is true, that Christ came into the world to save sinners. And from that is foremost. Now, that statement is accompanied with the actions of Paul. Christ saved us, not so that we can then just come and sit in the pews, but so we can go out and we can go and witness to others. This church in Ephesus 
was meant to go out and be missionaries among those in this town. And that was a challenging one because of all the things going on. So Timothy had his work cut out for him, and he had a lot of problems he had to deal with. But everyone at that church had a responsibility. But it all begins with building your life on that simple truth in verse 15, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners and of who I am foremost. What would radically change in our life if we accepted both those statements together, that Christ died for sinners and I was the most of that? We tend to look and judge our sins based on everyone else. That I, well, I'm a, I'm a better Christian than so-and-so. I don't sin as much as so-and-so. But when we think about all the things that we've done and yet Christ died for us, how much more do we want to serve? How much more do we want to show that light? How much more do we want to hope, show hope to those who have none? If he can do that for me, here's what he can do for you. And to be challenged by that message Verse 16, but I received mercy for this reason, that in me the foremost, Jesus Christ, might be displayed his perfect patience as an example to those who believe for eternal life, to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, to honor and glory forever. Amen. Another great statement to look at there in verse 16. I received mercy for this reason. Think about this in your own life. I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who believe in eternal life. Paul is saying, I got mercy. I received the mercy of Christ to show the patience of God. Realize that everyone you meet has the mercy of Christ because it's showing the patience of God. God is showing our patience in what he's doing with us. We are all not done yet. God is working on us and showing that even in our faults, he is showing his patience in dealing with us. Because again, we deserve to be cast out. When we sin against him, we deserve to be thrown. But Paul is saying, look, show mercy. And again, the reason I wanted to point out that this is a minister to a minister, because Paul is saying, these people are going to upset you. These people are going to make you mad. But realize the mercy you've been given. Realize the patience of, that God has just working on you so that as you minister to them, Realize the patience it's going to take. You can't just give up because they make mistakes. You can't just give up because they don't do exactly what you say. Show them mercy because God has shown you mercy. Show them patience because God is showing patience with you. So he says, I charge, this charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecy. Again, this charge. And this charge he's making there in chapter 1. In accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage good warfare, holding faith and good conscience. Go back to verse 5. Do everything with a good conscience. Do everything from a pure heart. Timothy has a fight. And sometimes in fights, we feel like we're losing, so we feel like we have to do something underhanded. We feel like we have to do whatever we have to to win. Paul is saying whatever it is that you do in your ministry, do so from a good conscience. Be able to go home and be able to lay your head on your pillow every night knowing what you've spoken, what you've done, what you have taught has come out of a good conscience. But understand it is a fight. One of the most underappreciated ministries that we have sometimes in a church is the ministry of the Christian educator. Because it is their job to make sure all the Sunday school teachers are teaching what they're supposed to and staying on top of them and holding them accountable to what they're going to teach. 
Because there's a lot of Sunday school rooms. There's a lot of discipleship training. There's a lot of people teaching a lot of stuff. And sometimes people get hurt. Sometimes people believe something that is wrong. And it's the job of the pastor and the Christian educator to help correct them in what they're saying. Because if you don't, and somebody teaches something, going back, if you remember last week when we did the whole peers of faith and what's required of salvation, if you have a Sunday school teacher, if you have a discipleship training teacher teaching something that is different from what your church believes, that's going to be a problem. That's going to lead to a major division if it continues to happen. Because what's true often, and sadly enough, in churches and life in general, is that relationships often trump theology. In other words, people will believe even crazy things because of the person rather than the truth. They'll cling to that, that person, they'll follow that pastor, that whatever, even if they don't speak what is true, it's because of the relationship they have with them. I say that to bring you to verse 20. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among who are Hominius and Alexander, who I'm handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. We hear mention of Hominius later on. Alexander's uh, name appears again in 2 Timothy. Alexander's a pretty common name, so we can't exactly say that's the same Alexander. But they both do not have good reputations. Paul's last charge to Timothy is to hand over these guys to Satan and out of the church. Now that's not a popular message today. We would say we got to do whatever we can to keep people in. But there are times God will hand over people to Satan. They keep playing their games, they keep playing with pride, they keep playing whatever they do, their sexual sins, and eventually God just hands them over. In church, we have a certain protection with God, those praying over us. And some people do that, and they come in, they try to live the life of the world still. They try to play around with pornography, adultery, drinking drugs, whatever vice you want to pick. And they think that I can stay in, and as long as I have the protection of God, I can do whatever I want to. Think about Job and Jesus. Sometimes God gives over people to Satan to show what, what faith is really all about. But sometimes it's like Judas. Judas when he's given over to sin and eventually takes him. Remember the parable of the prodigal son. Here you had a son who didn't really look at his father, he looked at the possessions of his father. And he wanted a party in the world. And so that's exactly what the father did. He let him have all that he wanted of the world. He gave him over to the world. And the son found out that all the world wants to do is take and took everything away from him. And there are Christians today that they have to find out that this game they're playing is going to take everything from them. And the only way they do is God lets them have it. God lets them turn over to learn not to blaspheme anymore. Eventually they come back, but sometimes they have to find out for themselves what that's about. Paul is saying you have to protect your flock. You have to protect your church. And there are those that are gonna to try to divide, but understand sometimes God turns them to Satan. And that's the hardest thing, and I have counseled with parents and grandparents that have seen that in their own children, that they have just turned completely from the church only to discover that they needed Christ the whole time, but they had to learn. Timothy has his hands full. 
Timothy has two guys that have been trying to blaspheme the church and has a church that is split. How is Timothy going to help restore order? What is Paul going to tell Timothy to do? That's what we're going to keep studying about as we dive through the rest of 1 Timothy. But remember tonight, this was the charge that Paul gave to Timothy. To do everything from a pure conscience. To do everything from his heart. In the same way, as we leave here tonight, before we leave, this altar is going to be open. What has your heart? What has taken you away from your ministry that you need to do, from the people that God has asked you to witness to? There are so many in our lives that aren't here at church, but not just that, they don't know Christ. And we claim to know Christ so we can show them, we should show them Christ in all that we do. Show them a relationship that means more. Show them hope to this hopeless world. But what is robbing us of that? What has defiled our heart? What has defiled our heart even as we come into God's house tonight? What are the thoughts that rob us, that have our pride and won't allow us to learn from God's word tonight, to submit ourselves in worship. What has our heart? What has our conscience? Maybe tonight you don't know Christ at all. Maybe you don't know that hope, and you don't know what would happen if you were to pass from this world. Don't leave tonight with that in mind, I don't care what happens at any little football game, that's the greatest victory we can ever have by turning our life to Christ. But if you need to recommit tonight, if you just need to come to the altar, the altar is going to be open. Thank goodness for Paul and his words. May we be challenged to know that we have sinned, but God's grace is more. We have turned from God, but his mercy is more. And his patience continues to endure. Even in our own lives, when we're not sure what's going to happen, we're not sure about the situations that we're in, God is always there. And he's always patient with us. Let us be patient as we deal with everyone we come in contact to. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for these challenging words that Paul has given us to Timothy. Even though this is between two ministers, Lord God, tonight, there is something that we can all learn from. As we come into your house, just as Paul charged Timothy with what he is supposed to do to the church in Ephesus, may we be challenged with this church in Bunker Hill, Lord God, that we all seek to do what we need to from a good conscience and a pure heart, Lord God. That whatever robs us of that, that has our pride, that we have to be right more than we have to be righteous, Lord God. Let that be taken away from us tonight so that we can proclaim your good word. God, there are problems in our lives. There are situations that we're going with. There are people that are impossible to deal with. Yet, you deal with us. So may we be challenged to redeem those that we're around, Lord God, the problems that we're going through. Instead of just rushing through it, just to get through it, may we be patient, Lord God, and realize it's not just about getting through. It's not about being happy, but it's about being holy in these situations and drawing closer to you. Whatever it is we're going through, thank you, Lord God, that you were always there and have brought us those challenges. May we learn gratitude, Lord God, even in the dark times to be thankful that you are the only good in us. So may we show others that goodness. I pray if there's anyone tonight that needs to come down and make a decision, Lord God, that they would not stop fighting no matter how big or small the crowd is, Lord God, no matter what others may say, they may come down to the altar to pray. Whatever it is that you laid upon their heart, Lord God, may they not leave this place with their salvation in doubt without you asking them, Lord God, to follow. May they do as you command. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the invitation. Have that own way, Lord, 544.
coming tonight. I pray that God would bless you as you leave this place. Remember to shine the light for him. There are those that are searching for hope in this community and those that you're going to be around tomorrow. They need to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you may be the only Bible that they read. So make it a good read that they have tomorrow and shine a light for him. Brother Adam Bass, if you pray for us.